Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. I believe we can start with uh, truths. In almost every gathering, you hear a man say, I'm happy to be here. And I am happy to be here, but not here. (laughs) I would rather be sitting where you are. Especially when there is a big crowd, I feel very nervous. In the time I have been in AA, I have uh, sat down in uh, committees uh, discussing who's going to be the speaker for a certain affair, and I have heard uh, all kinds of opinions as to why why a certain man or a certain woman ought to be the speaker, because uh, they have the flair to talk, they have the words to do it, they have the brains uh, to use their words, and and when I hear all of this discussion, I can't help to feel uh, as to when the time comes that somebody, without knowing too much about me, asks me to talk. <laughs> And the only reason why I accept to lead is because when I first came into AA, a man uh, told me, after listening to the many things that I had lost and the way I felt, uh, the man told me, uh, Max, because I'm not German, I'm not Swede. There are only three things that you are expected to do in AA, and if you do these three things, you are going to regain everything that you have lost and a lot more. Only three. First of all, don't ever take another drink. Second, don't ever miss your AA meeting. There are only two reasons why a man can miss a meeting, he said. One, He's either so sick in bed that he can't get up to make his meeting. The other one, if he has to work overtime because that's his bread and butter, and in AA, one's welfare comes first. And then, of course, any time that you are going to be asked to do something, regardless what it is, as long as you can do it, don't ever say no. Only three things, Max, and you are going to gain everything that you have lost and a lot more. And believe it or not, as time marched on, little by little, his words, his prophecy became a reality. (laughs) So for that reason, in spite of all that I know about 
my inadequacy to talk, when I'm asked to talk, I can't say no. <laughs> so that is the reason why I'm here. In regards to my story, well, it is about a year after the birth of this group, or in 35, they say that AA was born here in Akron. A blessing, a God's blessing had been bestowed on this town. And from then on, the message was taken outside of the city and little by little it began to touch the same blessing, it began to touch practically every community in the whole country. And today, there must be about, they say, 28,000 AA groups throughout the world. It is claimed that one alcoholic who keeps on drinking drags himself to a living hell and at least five innocents with them. <coughs> well, I was born in Mexico, I was raised there, my family made their living in the jungle, my mother claims that no one of our past generations ever went to school. Well, neither did I, of course. I never went to school in Mexico. We were too far away from any communities. My father used to make charcoal. And then, because of the revolution, he got killed. Then the oldest brother that was left to try to make a living, he also got killed. So, my mother, in constant fear that I and my other brother, the older, older, older brother, were going to meet the same fate, uh, he or she told us about coming here. One brother had already joined one faction of the revolution. I had already joined another one. We didn't even know what their banners were, but there wasn't anything else to do to make your bread and butter and that's where we were. And one midnight, when both managed to get into the hut to visit the family, my mother said that she had heard that a man from the same area had migrated to the United States. They were working in agriculture, and this was really a paradise and we listened to her she was crying her eyes out begging us to desert the armies and join her my brother and I we were afraid that if we were caught uh, on our getaway we knew we were going to be shot immediately 
But we listened to, we felt compassion for the mother, and we came. After a long uh, journey, we arrived in Texas, and on the Mexican side, families would wait for weeks sometimes, waiting for American men to come across and hire us. And we were very lucky that only after a week waiting at the plaza of Laredo, Mexico, a man came and he hired us, all of us. The weather was threatening the crops and they needed tents and he took care of our legal entry and so forth and we after we went through car immigration we were put in a state truck and uh, we drove for about almost four and a half hours to this uh, ranch and as soon as we got there we were put to work the same day with the same clothes. In a few days, we did find the place a paradise. We were given uh, credit to go to the general store and buy clothes, anything we wanted to. And there were some uh, natives who were complaining about the heat, but uh, we were young. We were not used to heat, but we were young and we were used to work, and we didn't mind it. We liked it. When we found out how much we were making, we had never, never dreamt that we could make that much money ever. And those were the wages at, in Texas at that time. I was 18, going on 19 years old, when I crossed the border. But somebody came, and in uh, Mexico, on Sundays, uh, we used to walk to the river. The women would wash the clothes. We take our baths and also them, and then after they were a little dry, we put them on, and then we would walk to the village, to the church of our faith. And now in Texas, we try to do the same thing on a Sunday. After we got to the church, a uh, clergyman very kindly approached us and asked us to follow him, and he took us outside, and he motioned with his arm that uh, there was another church. We could see the tower, and that's where we had to go. We just took it for granted that uh, maybe we were in the wrong faith, and that's what happened. But later on, we found out when inside of a restaurant at the nearest village that we were asked to leave because at that time, Mexicans were not allowed <laughs> to eat in some uh, public places. And that's the only <laughs> custom at that time. Thank God it has disappeared. But that's the only custom at that time that my brother and I, we couldn't get used to. <laughs> Especially after we were inside, clean clothes, at that time, we didn't swear, we didn't smoke, and with the mother and the younger brothers and sisters, uh, we just didn't like that. We couldn't get used to. 
And at night, my brother and I would talk about, about, ah, uh, maybe it'd be better to go back where we came from. But we were told that things were altogether different up north. And as soon as we would pay our bills, uh, we could start moving wherever we wanted to. But first we had to pay our bills at the plantation. And after two years, we were able to do that. And then we moved to San Antonio. And from there, my brother and I, we were hired as track hands working for different railroads, for different contractors. And my mother and the sisters, and the, they used to work or hang around the campus. And that's how, uh, little by little, we got as far as uh, Youngstown. And in Youngstown, we were hired by the BNO to work on a piece of track between Youngstown and Cleveland. And that's how we got to Cleveland. A lot of people think that we came as tourists directly from Mexico to visit the U.S. and we like Cleveland and we stayed there. <laughs> so here, up to this time, uh, my brother and I, we had never drank in Mexico from the time I was six, seven years old at the village on Sundays we could see some of the men that live in the area drinking alcohol and now at the village I I could see the different stages that a man goes through when getting drunk and what some people laugh about the contortions that they would go through and the way they talk I could never see myself anything funny about it. I could never laugh. To me, it was sad. Especially when the army men would come and dump the men on a straw mattress and be pulled by mules to what they called it at that time, jail. And then the family behind, crying, following the sick men. So for that reason, I had never touched it. But here in Cleveland, I got married to an American girl. Her father and mother were Hungarians. And I had become a dishwasher working at the Stadler. And when we decided to unite our lives, I had visited her home one time, but it had been a very brief uh, visit. And now I was there again to tell her father and mother about what we had decided to do. And the father uh, told her, or he asked me uh, where I work. And I told him, I, at the Stadler, what doing? I says, I wash dishes. And uh, how much you make on that job? And I told him, I believe it was seventeen fifty a week. And then he said a bad word. <laughs> Meaning, some kind of a fertilizer. <laughs> I told my wife who talks Spanish to tell him that besides the 1750 that I got a week, I also got my two meals, two meals a day, and sometimes even three uniforms a week. She told him that, and he said the same word <laughs> that he said before, only louder. The wind-up of that visit was that he told her 
that if she wanted to marry me, to go ahead, but never expect to go back to their house. And, <clears throat> and on that uh, basis, on that uh, basis, we left. She followed me and told me she couldn't understand why, why they were so religious and yet they couldn't see no reason, uh, for, to object our marriage except that I was a Mexican. But at any rate, she says, we are going to get married. And we did. Uh, about, this was in 1930. One day she met a girlfriend who had graduated from high school with her and they exchanged abuse about their marriages. And this girl told my wife that her husband was a foreman in the garage and uh, and they wound up by saying that uh, maybe he could hire me and star me as a handyman and then later on maybe teach me the trade of uh, lubricating cars. My wife had asked me many, many times uh, to do just three things, but I never did. She had asked me with insistence that I ought to learn a few words of the language and get my citizenship papers. In that way, I didn't have to be a dishwasher all my life. But to me, that endeavor had appeared uh, impossible. Anytime I heard people talk English, uh, to me, uh, it became an impossible thing to do. Just the same like any one of you who may drop in China and, so, and hear the people talk, and you make up your mind it's impossible to learn that language, and you never try, so you never will. And that's what happened to me. But I did not want to tell her the truth. I didn't want to tell her that I just felt I was too dumb to do that. And I never did. She also wanted us, she lived with my mother and the rest of the, my brothers and sisters, to change our menu because she claims that uh, Mexican food was delicious once every five years <laughs> because it was too too spicy and too greasy and that's why we all look like hell. <laughs> but my mother didn't know any other cooking. So we went on the same way we were. But now this uh, job at the garage, I did, I did accept her suggestion and I left the starter and I went to that uh, garage and there were four or five men who lived in my neighborhood and they asked me to ride with them and then on payday, I would uh, chip in for the gas. And I did. But on the way home, these men would get off and go to what it was known at that time as a bootlegging place. It was an Italian family house, very decent, very clean. And uh, they would go in and come out right away and go on home. But one day I decided to go in out of uh, curiosity and I saw what they, what was going on there. The man made his uh, whiskey in the basement and he bring it up to the kitchen in a big pitcher and then he fill up a small cream glass pitchers and the man would drink each one for 25 cents and I, 
and I, I did that. Out of a curiosity, I put one in my mouth, and I thought it burned my throat, it burned my throat, but after it got to my stomach, I also shook myself like I saw those men do, and, and later on, I began to feel a feeling that I had never experienced in my life. I like it. I like it. And it didn't take me long before I was staying there until the men would throw me out. It didn't take long before I started coming home late. It didn't take long before I started even raising my voice at home and criticizing my mother's uh, cooking. And I complained if they eat before I, I got home. I complained if they didn't. And finally, uh, weekends, I had to do what they had told me to do to uh, stop the shakes and start drinking on a Sunday morning. And I would feel better for a while. So I started drinking again. And then on a Monday, I couldn't get up. I wanted to, but I couldn't get up. And finally, the garage man told his wife to tell my wife that there was no work because I was laying off. I was being late. And they didn't want to tell my wife the truth so as not to hurt her feelings. And they let me go. And I went back to the starter. The chef liked me. And he told me, I told you, when you wanted to go and work at that garage that you weren't going to, you wasn't going to like it. It was too dirty. So, you, I can't give you a job back. I got a good man doing it. But I give you a better job now. You are going to be a helper to the different cooks. And in that way, you are going to be a cook very shortly. But after three weeks or two weeks, the man called me and he says, Max, you are not the same man that worked here before. The watchman has seen you drinking. Your time card shows you are late. You're only three weeks and you have missed two Mondays. There's something wrong with you. You're not the same man. You either change to what you used to be, or I have to let you go. And the following week, I went drunk on Monday, and they told him about it, and he kept his promise. He let me go. Now I was being picked up on weekends and put away in prisons. Then later on, because they claim that I was too persistent, they start to send me to central police and there and wait there for Monday to be sentenced and sent to the workhouse. And whenever I was sent to the workhouse, now my wife was pregnant, and the kids were all going to school, we were on welfare. They went all, they call it charity at that time. And at that time, the social workers would take uh, the names of all your friends and relatives when you first apply for help, and without knowing, later on, the social workers will call on your relatives and tell them about your plight and ask them if they couldn't help you with something. And if the relatives would help, the social worker would know how much, and in that way, they would uh, fix a budget for you. 
And that's the thing that uh, my wife uh, hated with all her soul because the social workers went to her father's and the father told them that uh, they had no daughter. That when they she got married uh, to me, they lost it and they didn't want to be bothered and they never, and that's that. And they never offered any help. So the fact remains that uh, I wanted to, every time I was sober, my mother would talk to me and uh, she would tell me that I was one of the luckiest men that she had ever seen in her whole life because uh, in Mexico I would have never, never had a chance to have married somebody with the high degree of education that my wife had. She had a commercial high school. That was the extent of her education. But my mother marveled at her uh, when she found out that she could type and then she could take shorthand uh, in Hungarian, uh, in Spanish, and in English. And uh, and my mother would say, uh, and how, how can you treat that woman like that? Well, someday she would tell me she is going to get tired. She is going to get tired someday, and when that happens, this kind of a woman will never, never forgive. Well, and that's exactly what happened uh, later on. One day, my wife, my mother told me uh, she couldn't take it anymore. Uh, to her, it was a disgrace, a shame for a young man like myself, so strong and so able-bodied. And yet, she found out that we were we were getting charity because. I had become a drunkard, a bum, and a tramp, and she ran away. She ran away. <clears throat> Months later, we found out that she wound up with uh, my brother in Chicago. So the wife and I, we were left alone with the baby. And I went to Mexico. When my mother told my brother and sisters about what had happened to me, she says, every time he's down on the floor drunk, he yells at the top of his voice and he blames me because I brought him uh, here to this country, he says. He says that because he's a Mexican and he can't talk the language, he's always doing uh, the dirtiest work that nobody else wants to do here and for the lowest pay. And I feel somewhat guilty about it. Could you please help me? So they did. They gave me all of their savings. They bought me a brand new Buick. They taught me how to drive it. And they told me, go to Mexico, Ricardo. You are, we believe what you say. You are too old to learn the language and to learn a trade, so get to go there, start a business of your own, sell the car, and use this, all this money, and then later on, call for your wife. And I did that. I went all the way to Laredo, I crossed the border, and in Laredo, Mexico, I got drunk, and I woke up in a jail, I have a 14 inch stab on my back and <clears throat> I did not know what happened when I came to. I saw Mexican women tearing stripes from their skirts, making bandages to stop the bleeding. And the first thing I, I thought of was the car and the money. I remember what that car had been given to me for, what I was supposed to do and the money 
I look in my pockets, not a penny. I began to yell at the top of my voice uh, to the guards, and they came, and they told me that they didn't know, they didn't even know what, what I was in jail for. Uh, it was the other shift that took me in, so they didn't know. But they warned me that if I didn't keep quiet, uh, they were going to throw me in the, dun- in the dungeon. So I, so I stayed there a week, and after a week's time, they told me I had hit a man's car on the street, drunk, and, uh, but the man is, had a big heart of gold, and uh, all he wanted was to keep my car in lieu of payments for the damages that I had done to his car. Uh, if I promise that I get out of that town within, the, within the eight hours, uh, because otherwise they were going to put me in the pen. And later on, I found out that the man that I, they claim I hit with my car was the son-in-law of the governor in charge of the army post there. And <laughs> there was nothing else to do but to sign the bill of sale. They told me, put an X. I couldn't write my name, put an X, and I lost the car. And I didn't have a penny. Uh, so one midnight, I had to, with other men and women, cross the river because I couldn't come back uh, legally. I tried to, but I went to the American consulate, and the first thing they asked me, are you a U.S. citizen? When they asked me that, I remembered then how many times the wife had asked me to get my citizenship papers. And if I had, I would have had no trouble in coming back. And I wouldn't, then I would have been helped by the American consul to get my car back and some of my money. But not being a U.S. citizen, I had no place to go. So that's why I crossed the river. And that's the only way I could make it. Some of the men that crossed the river that night, some of them were really bad men. I heard them talk about the different penitentiaries that they had been and how they, how many times they had been deported and now they were going back. But the same men, uh, show me, uh, how they, get to the outskirts of uh, Laredo, Texas, and they show me how to hop uh, freight trains uh, to start the journey home. So on the way back, riding these uh, freight trains, for the first time, for the first time in my life, I began to uh, ponder as to what in the world had happened to me. <laughs> I remember my childhood and I remember that my father never once beginning uh, what I think it was the my spiritual awakening because I had never been surrounded by so many men of that ca- category. I began to feel as uh, an equal and uh, I really felt wonderful. Uh, the same man, Mr. Kensick, told me, don't, don't go home. I'm going to drive you home. I don't know how he knew that I didn't have no transportation. But, uh, but he took me all the way from Lakewood, way from Lakewood, all the way from Lakewood, from the Chamber of Commerce, that's where they were meeting at that time, to the flap house. And by the time I got there, I, I had told him I, all along about, uh, no woman to sleep with, I mean my wife, and no money, no job, and uh, hungry, and uh, and that man, I thought he was going to hit me again, like a Harry Ryan, because he told me he had never, in all his life in AJ, uh, uh, heard a man ask for so damn much after his first meeting. <laughs> and, uh, and I wasn't asking him for all of that, I was just telling him how things were. And that's the man, that's the man who told me how I was going to get everything that I had lost and a lot more 
if I did those three things I told you at the beginning. He told me, don't ever take a drink again, Max. And don't ever miss your meeting. And he gave me those two reasons that I told you. Only if I was so sick I couldn't get out of bed. Or if I had to work overtime. And don't ever say no when they ask you to do something. And that's the way it started. Him and his wife started to take my wife and the kid out and myself on Sundays for dinner. And his wife gave my wife some very nice used dresses and shoes. And then uh, they told her about giving me another chance. And my wife said, no. If he wants to stop drinking for his mother and daughter, fine. And if not, that's his business. We are through. I lost eight children through miscarriages. And now I have one. And nobody is going to hurt that child. And she was really very attached to the uh, to the kid. Uh, so after after nine months that I was in AA, the wives of the AAs at that time they had no name. They were no they there was no name of Alanon, but they were doing the same thing. Four or five of them got together and they went to see her, and they told the stories of their husbands. Uh, that some of them had been even worse than I had been somewhere in a penitentiary or had been in a penitentiary driving when drunk and killing somebody and now they were out and they were uh, altogether different and they told her, for the sake of your daughter, give them another chance. You don't have to live with them. I mean, love them. Just live with them. And uh, that's that for for your daughter. So anyhow, they convinced her with her, with her stories. And she said, okay, providing he'll do three things. One, ask him if he wants to spare, to learn a few words of the language, and I help him uh, to be, uh, to get his citizenship papers. Uh, the other one, ask him if he wants to try American food. Uh, you, and then, the third, ask him if he wants to take a bath at least once a week. Well, she was exaggerating. But at any rate, on that basis, we got together. We got together. And I did try, and I did try because uh, three years later, I got my citizenship papers. I told immigration the truth. Anybody here who has applied for citizenship papers, uh, there is one question that you have to answer, and that is, how did you get into the country the last time? <laughs> they had told me about the evils of lying and the virtues of uh, telling the truth, so I began to practice that, began to practice that, and I told immigration the truth, what happened and how. And they told me, because you have said the truth, you can go back to Mexico, just touch Mexican soil with one foot, and then come back and show this uh, paper on the American side, and they're going to let you in. And then when you come back here, we're going to give you your citizen papers, and that's what happened. I saved, I saved my money with my wife, and then I went to Mexico, and I came back, and I got my citizenship papers. Uh, Mickey Kensick, the man that uh, I, I first talked to at the door, he got me a job in a shop for the first time in my life. I worked in a shop as a laborer. And then... I began to complain shortly after I got into AA that uh, uh, when I was drinking, I was the healthiest man on earth. And now I stopped drinking, 
and I couldn't sleep at night because I sweat so much and my legs wobble, my back hurt, and I was very nervous and they told me the reason for that is because the boost is leaving your body and uh, as soon as you start working, you can afford, go and see a doctor and tell him that you are an alcoholic for how long you uh, live the way you did and then he'll fix you up. Don't worry, don't worry. Uh, this will pass. Uh, this will pass. And as time went on, uh, that's what happened. I went to see the doctor and the doctor told me that I was undernourished and uh, um, my uh, belly was full of poison fat and uh, but he gave me a, a diet and uh, he gave me vitamins and uh, he told me how to uh, rest without any pills or any more booze and as time went on I, I felt better and I got well again. The trouble that I had really was not so much the physical end of it. The truth is that I I had a hard time uh, to start getting up early in the morning. I had a hard time in uh, being clean. I had a hard time in uh, eating the kind of a food that was uh, given to me uh, in the morning and at noon, and uh, I did. Uh, and then I had a hard time in sticking to the truth. I had a hard time in not lying. And I, the, the man at the AA told me that uh, about the making amends, I had to pay all my bills. They told me, your wife says that she can't get a penny for the credit because you owe Ross and Bloom $17 for a coat that uh, you bought for her many years ago and you never pay in full, so now you better pay. Among the deaths, I told this uh, man about uh, one bootlegger who claimed that I owe him seven dollars, and I thought that was too much, and I wanted to know if I had to pay that too. And he said, "You damn right." Uh, maybe he's lying, but uh, he says, "You well, you better pay him." So little by little, I began to uh, to pay that man. The uh, as time went on, they talk about the spirituality of the uh, program. I began to uh, help uh, go with the men uh, to visit uh, sick men in nursing homes. At that time, all the nursing homes in Cleveland and outside, they were charging $35 a week, a week, uh, uh, for a nursing home, in a nursing home. And I... And I went with this uh, man, and I saw how they uh, treat the men. I noticed that every time they went, they used to buy a lot of cigarettes and then uh, give them to the men. So uh, after I was able to do that, I also began to buy cigarettes and uh, hand them to the men. And finally, one day, uh, I told the men, I have called on all the Mexicans that I drank with, and I have told them about uh, AA, but nobody wants to uh, join, and uh, my wife was uh, typing short sentences of the big book, sentences of the big book into Spanish, and I take them and I give it to them, and then uh, I don't say all the Mexicans drank the way I did, but there were six or seven that they, they were alcoholics like I was, and then they started to talk among themselves. They said, you know, uh, Ricardo uh, has changed he says that he's working there every day, 12 hours a day, and that he's giving his wife every cent that he makes, and uh, and he's not swearing anymore, and uh, and uh, he doesn't go to no place without his wife, and now he's going to those uh, meetings, and uh, so they started to think that I had become a homosexual. So nobody joined. Nobody joined. And my wife heard about it, and she says, don't pay any attention. If those men think that to be a man is to live like beasts, let them. 
For the first time in your life, you are becoming a decent man. You were born one. You were a decent man when I first married you. But later on, you weren't. And now for the first time, you are returning to that life. So never mind what they say about you. Uh, their wives wish that uh, they were as manly as you are. So stay the way you are. And that's the way, and that's the way it was. About, uh, oh, maybe ten years after I came into AA, I complained because, uh, I was, uh, I just couldn't get a man sober. So this time, this time, the man told me, if you keep this attitude, you're gonna wind up drunk. You are not God, you're not a saint, and you're not even an angel. All you are supposed to do is give them your heart with a lot of compassion and tell them what AA did for you, and if they want it, they can do what you did, and if not, don't pay any attention. You are not going to change nobody, no more than anybody change you. You want it to change, and you did it, so that's the way it is. So at any rate, one day one of men asked me if I wanted to co-sponsor. And I said yes, so we went over to the, uh, what they call it, the South Side, a very rough uh, neighborhood in uh, Cleveland, uh, mostly Russian, Croatian, Central European. And uh, we picked up a man from the uh, lawn. And the wife was outside with the kids. And one 15, 16 year old kid had a, ba a bat in his hand. So in case the men wanted to go in again, they were, he was going to club them. So there, there was a man there. And now uh, we pick him up and put him in that man's car. And the wife said to him, uh, to the sponsors, don't ever bring that so and so again here because if you do, you're liable to get killed yourself. So we took him to Rosary Hall, and the men puked all over the men's car and on my clothes. And then after we left him at Rosary Hall, uh, the men told me to get the horse a pail of water and wash his car, and I did. And uh, and then he couldn't go and pick up the men. Uh, I did. I did. She sent me to pick him up, and then I uh, took him home. And uh, the man told me, if they start any trouble, if they start any trouble, just take him away. Take him away, uh, hold him in your house, and wait until you I go to see you because I can't go with you. I got a job to do. So I did. But uh, before that, he told the wife what was going to happen and what had happened with other men. And when I took him home, uh, there was the wife and the kids waiting for the man, and the man, uh, put, he just put his head down, and he told him in Russian or Croatian uh, that he was sorry for what he had done, and uh, they let him in, they let him in, and they all hugged him, and they told him not to worry, and uh, to me, that was what I thought uh, uh, the peak of the spiritual awakening uh, that I have had in, in AA. I don't know what else I can tell you except, except that, uh, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for the invitation and forgive me for having taken so much of your time. And now you know, don't ask me to come back again. Shall we try? <laughs> Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.